Hi, Clutter Fairy fans. Welcome to the Clutter Fairy Weekly for September 8th, 2020. I'm your co-host, Ed Gumnick, and I'm speaking with Gail Goddard, professional organizer and owner of the Clutter Fairy in Houston, Texas. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Clutter Fairy Weekly, which is our webcast and podcast where we talk about all things organized. And generally, we try to uh, troll through all of our comments you make on the social media channels to find out what we're going to talk about. And we so appreciate that you do that for us. If you're joining us in the Zoom meeting for the first time, you could share your comments and questions via the chat, and I'll try to make sure Gail addresses them before we move on to the next topic. You can also use the raise hand feature to let me know if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment yourself via audio or video. We're streaming live on Facebook, and you can share your questions and comments there as well, and I'll relay them to Gail. And during the live webcast every Tuesday, you can call us to talk to us directly by calling 669-900-6833. Use meeting ID 993-419-863 to join the meeting. Okay, let's get to our topic. We have a lot to cover. We do. We wrote a lot about this. Our topic today is the second installment of our series on a decluttering philosophy, changing our relationship to stuff. The goal of this series is to create awareness of all the components of our relationships with stuff as we work to formulate or clarify our personal decluttering philosophies. Today we're going to talk about emotions, the ones that come into play as we acquire stuff, the ones that influence our tendency to keep too much, and the ones that we might cultivate and leverage to help us let go to reduce our clutter. Last week we talked about developing a decluttering philosophy based on what we want in life and then what stuff we need to support that life. So this week we're going to talk about the emotions that either support us in that pursuit or the negative ones that block us from reaching those goals. First we need to give our usual disclaimer for when we talk about the psychology of clutter. We are not mental health professionals as I'm sure you know <laughs> so we're not qualified to diagnose or treat mental health issues. The ideas we want to share with you are based on our personal experiences, plus 13 years of observing the emotional components of hundreds of clients' clutter issues. We hope that the information we offer may help you to understand and navigate your issues with clutter, but if you're finding the struggle too much to manage on your own, we encourage you to seek outside help, either in the form of mental health services, professional organizing services, or a combination of the both. We really don't want you to struggle, and we really hope that you'll seek support if you need it. That's what we're trying to say here. <clears throat> now let's get into it. There are two broad categories of behavior that lead to clutter. The tendency to bring too much stuff in, and the tendency to not let enough go out. <laughs> These behaviors are driven or reinforced by a lot of different emotions. There's some overlap, but we're going to take inventory of the emotions involved in clutter First from the point of view of why we collect too much, then from the perspective of why we have trouble letting go. Then we'll talk about some of the potential emotional rewards you might reap by shifting your thinking and your habits around stuff. I hear about the negative emotions most often because that's my job really. Those who are stuck in the negative emotions about their stuff in their lives are the ones who call for my help. And if you're listening to this, likely you're already feeling some of the things I'll describe. When you're looking at the accumulation of your possessions and you're frozen in place because of it, then this list is going to sound very familiar to you. So category number one, too much stuff coming in. Why do we bring in too much stuff? We tend to speak casually and humorously about shopping therapy because there are some very real ways in which people use shopping as a means to alleviate negative emotions and to create feelings of comfort or release. Sometimes we shop for distraction or as a form of entertainment, and spending time shopping with friends is fun, and looking at new things is fun. Forgetting for a while about your life and your stress and your worries is fun. Or maybe we shop to alleviate boredom. But shopping therapy is a fleeting and temporary fix or an attempt to feel better that doesn't last beyond a few moments. The feeling is temporary, but the clutter is permanent. Sometimes we buy stuff to relieve feelings of inadequacy or insufficiency. We allow ourselves to be persuaded to buy stuff because we think it will make us better versions of ourselves. Some organizing experts refer to the things that we purchase in response to this impulse as aspirational clutter, aspirational clutter. The idea that 
if we buy the right thing, we will become a better person. <clears throat> we buy stuff to relieve the feelings of emptiness that stem from loss, loneliness, or heartache. I remember doing this when I was depressed. Somehow we think getting more stuff will mend a broken heart. We buy stuff in response to social pressure from our family and our friends and the culture in which we live. Social media has made this pressure much worse as more people use Facebook and Instagram to publicize a very idealized version of their lives. We buy stuff in response to the tendency to compare ourselves with others. This tendency is captured in the old cliche about keeping up with the Joneses. We have a desire to feel equal, if not superior, to our neighbors and friends. We buy stuff out of fear. We have a need to feel safe and secure, to be protected against deprivation or disaster. So we stockpile supplies and buy more than we need, sometimes more than we would ever use in a lifetime. We're afraid we'll end up without something we need, without giving ourselves credit for the ability to adapt and find a solution if this should actually happen. We buy because evolution wired us for acquisition. Our ancestors evolved in conditions of scarcity, so even those of us who now live in a state of fairly reliable abundance act in response to ancient drives to get more of anything good, anything useful. Useful is a big one. And of course, we buy in response to advertising messages that take advantage of all these emotional triggers. Those of us who live in a consumerized modern world are swamped by as many as 5,000 advertising messages a day, poking at us with reminders that we should be better, we should have more, we should fill the empty places in our lives with stuff. That's about stuff coming in. Now let's talk about category two, which is that there's not enough stuff going out. So once we've collected too much stuff, what are the emotional reasons we hang on to things that don't serve us? Sometimes it's about feelings of self-worth. Our self-image and our sense of self-worth gets tied up in the things that we keep. For example, our self-worth is connected to our success. It's hard to let go of the tangible evidence of success, such as the school records or transcripts, uh, awards you get from work, or athletic trophies for all the teams that you're on. If our self-worth is rooted in our relationships or in being loved and appreciated, it can be difficult to get rid of unwanted or unused gifts. Sometimes our stuff becomes connected to our very identity. We go so far as to define ourselves in relationship to our possessions. Here's an example of baby clothes. Baby clothes create a sense of connection to our early experiences of defining ourselves as a parent. Here's a related note about that. We often suggest taking photographs of things that you're having trouble letting go of for emotional reasons. There have been a couple of studies that look specifically at the difficulty older parents have with letting go of their children's clothes, toys, and artwork, and found that keeping photographs of the stuff alleviated a sense of loss by helping preserve that earlier sense of identity. And I think that the photographs of anything would probably create a similar alleviation. You will feel still connected to that sense of identity with the photograph even if you let go of the thing. Just as fear provides an impulse to acquire things, it drives us to keep too much. We fear what might happen if we don't keep this thing. We fear the loss of security and status and comfort and love. We also have a fear of regret. We fear making a toss decision that might later end up regretting. But if we let this fear run, run wild, it invariably leads to keeping way too much stuff. Sometimes letting go represents failure. Getting rid of things can feel like an admission of guilt or a failure to accomplish what those things represent. For example, getting rid of the skinny jeans means we're giving up on ever reaching that weight loss goal. Or we feel guilty about the money spent on something, or as we say, the money that we wasted on something. So we keep the stuff to justify the original expenditure. And what about nostalgia? Sometimes we keep things that remind us of the good old days, but we often skew that reality of the past by sentimentalizing it to the point of being unrecognizable to our more rational selves. Nostalgic clutter is often an unhelpful reminder of the past that can block us from moving forward in our present life. Sometimes we keep things because of poorly defined boundaries. We find ourselves taking responsibility for other people's stuff such as hand-me-downs or family heirlooms. 
But we don't want or need things. They infringe on our ability to nurture or create our own lives and identities. Sometimes we keep things as a buffer against pain. Clinical psychologist Noah Mankowski suggests that clutter may not only be a representation of our emotions and memories and identity and self-worth, but they may also be a shield against deeper issues that we don't want to confront. Both what we keep and where we keep it can signify emotional experiences that we need to unpack, both literally and figuratively. For example, he suggests clutter in the basement or the attic might mean difficulty letting go of the past. Clutter in the bathroom can relate to issues with body image, since this is where we spend the most time looking at ourselves in the mirror. Ugh. A cluttered bedroom might relate to issues of intimacy or sexuality. Clutter in the living room may be connected to difficulty in our social lives. This next category is emotional cost of living with clutter. So let's talk about the emotional toll that clutter takes on us and the gains we might get from making a choice to let go of the stuff. Less clutter leads to less anxiety and stress. There's a strongly documented connection between the amount of excess stuff in our living spaces and the stress hormone cortisol. Less clutter can mean reduced tension within our relationships. If you and your partner are not in agreement about how much stuff is okay, this can be an ongoing source of friction between you that may last your entire marriage, truly. Clutter often leads to feeling of ineffectualness. A stronger version of this feeling is shame. Feeling ineffective can feel shameful. Getting clarity in our spaces can help, help us reclaim a sense of purpose and effectiveness. A cluttered space at home can lead to difficulty in shifting from your work life to your home life. And boy, is that completely tossed on its side by being in the pandemic when your work life and your home life are all at home right now. To get good rest and relief from your workday, you need a space that provides a sense of relief and sanctuary. Clutter creates a sense of fatigue. Among other things, cortisol leaves us feeling emotionally fatigued and physically exhausted. Clutter drains away mental resources that could be better spent elsewhere. Finally, we'd like to talk about positive emotions that affect our efforts to declutter. Positive emotions can be both influencing our ability and our willingness to let go of things and can serve as an incentive or a goalpost that we're aiming for. Think about generosity. Think about the person who can make use of your stuff in a better way than you. And can feelings of generosity provide a motivation that you need for letting go? If you feel like you're being generous in giving your things to someone else that can use them, maybe that is a positive emotion that is going to reinforce your ability to let go. What about gratitude? If we reflect on feelings of gratitude for what we already have, we might discover a shift in our attitudes about what we really need. A popular trend in recent years has been to keep a gratitude journal. Think about writing gratitude journal entries focused on the stuff that means the most to you. And this process might shed light on which things mean a little less than they once did. It might help you prioritize your things one against the other and see which ones are the most important and which ones are ready to be gone. Freedom. Reducing clutter means reducing the time we have to spend cleaning and maintaining that clutter, and that frees up time for other things in life. Ultimately, no one wants to spend all their time on the chore of decluttering and getting organized. It's a chore. And for me, it's a business, but for you, it's a chore. And so this is something that you don't want to spend 24-7 all of your waking time on. Getting it done, getting on with it, and maintaining it means that you have a whole much, a bunch of free time to do something that you care about more. Focus. Simplifying our surroundings makes it easier for us to concentrate. Being able to focus helps with feeling effective in our lives because we can accomplish things that are important to us. Clutter is something that is very distracting and very scattering. And being able to feel focused again is a great um, boost to your feelings of self-worth and value. Relief. A job complete and a spa space made usable and pleasant brings a sense of relief of a great weight lifting off our shoulders. 
I hear that from clients all the time that finally facing this project and getting it done brings such a sense of relief. And that relief is in direct proportion to how much that chore has been mentally chattering and burdening you with the sense of, I need to do this. I need to do this. I need to do this. And you can tell by how big your relief is, how much of a downer it had been before you got it done. Comfort. Because the space is easy to navigate and has things that make you feel happy, you feel comfortable in your space again. Who doesn't want to feel comfortable in their space? That is a wonderful emotion to aim for and a wonderful result to get from the work you have, you've done. Pride is another good one. Accomplishing something good for yourself and for helping others when you donate things to a cause or a person brings a sense of pride in yourself for being generous. <laughs> Supportiveness. When you can give to someone else and hopefully help them, you feel like you're being supportive, and that is something that makes you feel good about yourself too. Feeling energized. We feel energized in a space that's pleasing and orderly. That helps us get things done that need doing. This is the opposite, of course, of feeling drained and exhausted from uh, having clutter drain all your energy. If you can get past that point, then you're going to feel more energized. And that gives you the ability to concentrate and focus and put your attention towards something that you care about. Calmness, being calm. Reducing the chore of organizing a space brings calmness when the clutter no longer invades your mental space so completely. I find that clients talk about the mental chatter that's happening. They don't realize it exactly, but every time they walk by something they feel like that needs doing or they should be doing or they need to tackle and they feel overwhelmed by, there's a constant you know, conversation that's going on in your head. You need to be doing this. You need to be doing this. And getting that project done or getting it to a place where you feel like you have the plan to get it done brings you a sense of calm because that mental voice stops making so much noise. And calm is a wonderful thing, right? It's certainly stress relieving. The last positive emotion that I have listed here is peacefulness because we want you to live in a place that is truly a retreat and brings you a special peace. If you can make your home feel like that supportive retreat and beautiful space where you feel safe and secure and pleased and proud, you will feel peaceful there. And that's a wonderful feeling to aim for. So this is the point where I'm ready to have conversation with you guys about it. Does anybody have any comments they want to make here? Charlotte asked to ask a question. I'm going to ask her to unmute herself. Yes, you thank go. you so so much for being here. You're such an inspiration for people. Hey, Charlotte. At the... Hi, how are you? I'm fine. How are you? Good. Nice to see you. Um so you know I you talked to me a number of times which I really appreciate about letting go of a collection of artwork plus all the art supplies. You were so kind. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and you you do discuss that about people with crafts and getting, you know, what to do with all this stuff that you made and so on. So um, anyway, a friend said she would try to put it on eBay, and even though that's of course not an expensive, you know, people don't usually spend. It's not like going to a gallery and buying art. But exactly. it still would kind of lessen the load that I'm trying to, that's cluttered up my whole half of my house. So do you think that's a good idea? Take her up on the offer or is it sort of a business I got to be careful entering into? I think that you should take, uh, if somebody's willing to help you and you're willing to recognize that the burden for you is more about the collection than getting the best amount of money out of it. I think yes. that that's a great solution because you're, you're really trying to um, get to a broader audience and move it along. And right now, frankly, um, you know, not a lot of people are wandering around in galleries. Like they're not spending the time and space doing that. Right. So right. Um, even if you could create a way for people to see it in person, uh, you're not going to have the same level of audience as you would have had last year. Yes. So I think this is a perfect um, adaptation. Why not give it a shot? Yeah, well, and you can and you can start as small as you like. You know, yes. give your give your friend a few pieces, 
and yeah. you know you you can also eBay lets you set a reserve price so you can say I don't want to take less than X dollars mm -hmm. and if it ends without selling then you haven't you know then you you can always list it again and lower your reserve price if you okay. know if, if to, that's to, a good idea you're ready thank to you. make it move all right thank you you're Thanks. so welcome we appreciate you coming to chat with us today thank you i wanted to share a comment from april april said i think a lot of the things i bought were out of guilt for being a working mom i bought my kids a lot of stuff and even though most of it has been outgrown it's hard to get rid of sometimes because my kids don't want to get rid of it and sometimes because i can't bring myself to do it that's such a mom thing <laughs> such a mom <laughs> thing because basically you have memories uh, related to the stuff that the kids don't even remember like they, their experience of it is completely different than yours and and this is where you know they've you're describing things that are really keepsakes so you're having an emotion um that is about memory and nostalgia and loving your kids and i'm guilty as a mom i you know i was a working mom and i wasn't there enough and if your kids are grown and gone i think it's time to let go of the guilt of not being there i think that ship has sailed right like whatever their experience of you during that time was their experience and i'm sure that they would not come back to you and say gee mom you did a terrible job i think that there if you have a relationship with your kids and they're happy and they love you and they don't remember most of your you have a much stronger memory of it than they do of course because they were kids and so let them keep their favorites if they want to take them to their own home <laughs> you don't have to be the storage unit for that and um and then i would go through the process of finding the pieces that are the most important to you and let some of the rest of them go that, like you can assume that if they're all if they all have some kind of attachment there's going to be a priority scale this one has more memories attached to it than that one this one makes you more happy you know that kind of stuff and so you can you can filter them a little bit for what's the strongest emotional attachment and let some of those things go away because you're not going to forget their childhood you're totally uh, dialed into that <laughs> and you're not going to lose your sense of um, wonder or love for your children because some of those things from when you were trying to make up for not being present are gone and and keeping them apparently isn't making you feel any less guilty so i think that the the real issue here is talking about processing that that guilt and facing it and letting it go now like the ship has sailed the kids are grown whatever happened happened and you know you have the relationship that you have now and so they clearly survived and you're not the only mother who worked and had to be not as available as they thought and you know all will be well <laughs> that's what i'm saying they still love you and if you worry about it and you worry about feeling guilty you know have a conversation with your kids about it ask them about it do you think i did a terrible job are you okay if i let this stuff go you know examine it until you feel okay with not carrying those anchors around forever and ever i'm in that's my feedback <laughs> about that <laughs> in response to charlotte's question l mentioned i've seen art marketed successfully on instagram if you are and if they want to go to instagram as well yeah if you're looking at extra work okay. instagram is a little more it's there's a little more labor involved because you can list it and provide contact information and someone will have to t contact you and talk about yeah, um, that a little how that works somebody has uh, raised their hand down below yeah. lorraine has a question i'm going to ask oh. her to unmute lorraine are you there yeah hi, um, it, <laughs> hi it can be the the clutter can be kind of a catch-22 there's clutter and it depresses me and i go to attack it and i lose all energy because it's cluttered 
So it's kind of like a snowball thing. I mean, it's like the areas that I have cleared, it's easy to keep them clean. Right. The ones where some of the stuff that I couldn't make, you know, I couldn't make up my mind or I didn't finish part of that and I shoved it off over there. I go in there and it's just, where's the gumption, you know? So it sounds like that um, in order to clear some areas, uh, some of the stuff got relocated, right? So you're sort of moving of it, yeah. the clutter around the house a little bit. Yeah, and, and in doing so, as you clear areas, if you back it all into one room, eventually the backwash is going to fill a room, right? Like it's, right. you keep uh, sweeping and sweeping and eventually you're in the corner with the pile of dirt, right? <laughs> and so, uh, so let me say, I applaud you for making um, the, the other areas clear and some of the stuff must have gone out the time and some yeah. of it were stuff that you weren't comfortable facing decisions about. And so having gotten to the clear space, I would go back and look at the things that you held back. Instead of looking at all the things that are in the room that is, is overwhelming, <laughs> I would just go and look at the stuff that you couldn't make the decision about at the time because you're putting a whole bunch of energy in clearing a space, right? So you burn the energy on clearing out and setting up something that you like and that you can maintain. And so you can circle back for round two and go look at the stuff that you put aside in the moment because it was too much mental energy to make those choices and see if you can't make them now. Because now you've lived with a cleared space and you've lived without them being in it. And you may have less of an attachment now because they are removed from the place where you remember them. And you have a sense of you kept them just in case, but that just in case still hasn't happened. And so it might be easier than you think to pick up some of those things and make decisions about them now. Ah, okay. And if you, anybody that has created a room that is like the junk room, the backup, the, the pile off to the side, um, usually you're doing that in, in an effort to create space somewhere else and eventually create a mountain that you're too afraid to face, right? <laughs> it's gotten too big. So, um, one of the things you can do is, and this is a very clever little trick, take a sheet and throw a sheet over a bunch of it and uncover the portion that you want to work on so that you're only looking at a quarter, an eighth, a tenth of the contents of the room because that wall of stuff is like, it's like immediate mental shutdown, right? When you look at it, it's like, ah, oh, it's tall and it's too much. But if you cover it up, and then you fold back a corner and you only work on that stuff. It just makes it sectioning off the room into a smaller result, right? So it's um, creating a smaller pile for you to deal with. And the theory that you don't have a bunch of open space where you can spread that stuff out and work in, in smaller pieces, right? So you can um, sort of create that fake small, <laughs> small space by covering it up and peeling a corner. and um, if it's super tall, you may have to just go, a, you know, your little section at a time. What in here can stay and what in here needs to go in another room and what needs to go out. And then cover that and uncover another portion and do the same so that you don't unpack the whole room completely, but you can slowly by sections remove things. And then when you uncover the, a bigger portion of the sheet or uncover the whole thing, you're left with a much smaller pile. Do you see what I'm saying? You just need to get past the mental block of tackling it. And if it's grown to mountainous proportions, it's sort of mentally um, a shutdown, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Appreciate it. Rapunzel, who's with us in Zoom, says every piece of clutter is a physical man manifestation of uh, an unmade decision, which is a point we've we've made before. Yes. And clearing clutter is about making decisions not cleaning yes which is a good point and that's a useful distinction because it it's part of i think it's part of what trips people up they think i'm gonna i'm gonna declutter today and they think of it like mopping the kitchen floor you know or cleaning the stove which has simple a simple end point and a clear finish and all yeah. of that yeah and it's and much harder 
Yeah. And those decisions are blocked by your emotions, right? Like you can't make the decisions because the emotions you feel about the stuff, whatever the emotion is, it makes the decision making hard. And so the reason we're trying to talk about those those emotions is so that you recognize that the reason that you feel paralyzed about making the decisions is because you're having emotions about the stuff. And those emotions are the things that need to be tackled first. Recognizing what you're feeling, what it means, what you need to do about it will help you make the decisions later. But if it's, if you're stuck in decision making, it means that it's not just a routine process. It's not just a project that you're going to tackle, like mopping the floor. Everybody generally knows how to mop the floor or wipe the counter, right? Like it doesn't take a lot of thought. There's not a lot of emotional investment in it. It's something that's easy to do. But making decisions about stuff means that you have to face your emotional response to why you feel uncomfortable about letting go of that item. And, and Sometimes that emotion is much bigger than our ability to face the project and execute, you know, to just do steps to get it out of there. You have to be able to make those decisions. And um, if you get stuck there, then it, you have to look at the emotions that are blocking you off. And Lorraine added, if you are looking at it, at it as cleaning, then there's a negative attitude of being dirty when oh, it's not point. done. Yeah, and and and, and, and L's point which, of del delay decisions. Delay decision isn't dirt. It isn't yeah. dirty. It isn't a negative. It's just delay decisions, right? And, and so, and and Jenny added also decluttering is never done. So, if you think of it that way, as as cleaning and create that that sort of self self loathing attitude, then you're never going to you're never going to get get rid of it because it's always an ongoing project. Yeah, I mean decluttering, I mean once you get your house organized, decluttered, then you have to you keep living there and you keep buying stuff and you keep using stuff and so you have to develop the um, routine about um maintaining it. You have to have a process to maintain it. It isn't a one and done process. Um it there may be a one and done backlog project that's out there waiting for you to get finished but there's also the general routine of maintaining your space in a way that doesn't feel cluttered to you and so you have to be able to get to that decluttering routine and sometimes you know the place where you're starting is I have this huge backlog I, I don't even have the place organized yet I don't even have it cleared yet I don't even have it functioning how I want it and so there, you just kind of have to start there. But once you get through there and you have then created spaces that you feel like you can maintain and you feel like you like how it looks and it functions well enough for you, then you got to develop the processes to keep it that way. And that's, you know, another, that's another video about doing that. <laughs> Lori, who's watching on Facebook, asked how can a person get past thinking they need to get money for most items they want to get rid of that have monetary value and are new and are new well we have all talked about that a million times haven't we um this is a big hang up because you know nobody likes to feel like they're throwing money out the door and um but it takes a lot to <clears throat> how do i think about this the way that you buy stuff is because somebody created a store they made it inviting they collected a, a related uh, collection of things that you find appealing um, you know you go to the grocery store where they have food you go to the gift shop where they have gifts you go to the shoe store where they have shoes like that somebody goes to the trouble and administrative expense to fill a store staff a store and make it a, a place where you can go buy something and your version of that you trying to be a store requires a sim not exactly the same amount of capital outlay but it certainly requires effort and time on your part you have to be the one that 
has a garage sale, makes a listing, offers it on Facebook, puts it in the marketplace, you know, blah, 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 blah. There's a many, there's a million ways that you can attempt to take an item and get money for it. And the question really for yourself is, do you want to spend all the time and effort to be a shopkeeper to make that thing become money? And if you don't have that time or attention or skill set, then worrying about getting the money out of it is kind of a waste of time because you may want to get money out of it. But if you don't want to do the things to get money out of it or you don't feel like you have the skills to do the things you need to do to get money out of it, then what's the point of wishing for the money? <laughs> Right? Like there's only one way to get the money and it's to do all the steps that you need to do for each item that you want to sell. And if it's worth it to you to spend your time doing that, awesome and knock yourself out. But if you know that you're not ever going to do it, then expecting to get money out of it is sort of a, um, it's like a false goal. If you have no desire to be a shopkeeper or to interact with customers or to do what you need to do to advertise or make it available, then it's not going to be something that you're going to get. And I guess for some people that money may be totally necessary and they're willing to do it. But for some people like I wouldn't have a garage sale now, I'm too old for that. <laughs> I don't want to be out in the heat. I don't want to stand on my driveway for hours. Like that's a young person's game to me. Right. And so yeah, there's ways to make money at stuff, but right now, nobody's going to come up on your driveway like they don't want you breathing on them, right? <laughs> it, it's, it, you know, your ability to interact with people has been diminished right now, and your ability to create any kind of a physical marketplace is much diminished, and that means you got to go online, you got to start making it happen online. And if you don't feel like you can do that or you're not willing to do that because it takes too much time, then getting the money out of it is sort of, it's a dream that isn't real for you and accepting that and letting that value go to somebody else that needs it. And instead of thinking of it as I'm wasting money by giving this stuff away, Think of it as I am supporting someone by this is how I'm putting my money as a value to someone else. Like I'm giving this thing away that's new and someone else is going to be able to get it. And that's how I'm putting my money out in the world to be kind to others. It's really just a matter of point of view that you really accept that, yes, there's there's money value in this item but I don't have to be the one that gets the money out of it. I can pass that money air quote money a value on to someone else and be in, in benefiting them. Rapunzel makes a good point. Donating something brand new to a charity is a special gift. People who have very little get something brand new that is not a hand-me-down. It's a gift of dignity. And that, and that, all of the place, if somebody's going to the places where you donate to shop, they're not getting anything hardly ever that's new. And what a, what a blessing and a gift to them that you put something out in the universe that is fresh and they're the first owner. Like anybody that was the, the child, the youngest child or the middle child that got the hand-me-downs all the time, you know, that experience of, my sister wore this, my brother wore this, I never get new clothes, and your parents saying, mm, this is still good, you need to wear this. <laughs> like That is something that is so, every kid that wasn't the first kid can ex experience that in a, in a sort of a small scale, what it must be like to be at shopping at the Goodwill store, or being at a refugee center, or being at a church um, charity thrift store, where they're getting things handed to them or getting access to stuff because their house burned down and they're getting things given to them and how fabulous it would be to get something brand new. It's a kind thing to do. Denise, our, our friend from France who is watching on Facebook today. Hello, Ms. Denise. I'm so glad that you're here. That's super said, exciting. 
I did a couple of garage sales a few years ago and can't be bothered anymore. <laughs> you, you never get what you feel is the value of the item. And that's a good point. You know, you're sort of walking into that opportunity to feel undervalued. You know, you, so it's yeah. not only a lot of work to get rid of stuff that way, but you get insulted and sort of, <laughs> you know, reminded that your stuff was worth more to you than it is to other people. And how about the idea that if you, you think it's worth a certain amount of money, but when you go to a garage sale yourself, you totally know that you're going in there going, man, I am looking for the steal, the deal, the thing that I spend 20 cents on and it's worth $50. Like you are looking to lowball everything. And why do you think that your garage sale is going to be different? Why do you think that other people aren't coming up to your driveway going, I am looking for the steal. That's totally what they're doing. That's totally what you would do. And so the expectation that your garage sale is going to be a store where everybody pays you, you know, 75% of what you spend on the item because you remember how much money you wrote, the check you wrote to buy that thing. So I guess that's old school, right? The money you debited to buy that thing. What are these checks of which you speak? <laughs> right? I'm dating myself. But the point is, you have an expectation that the stuff is very valuable when you are the owner of the garage sale and you are a total scavenger hunter when you are shopping a garage sale and not assuming that everybody's going to come to your driveway looking for a deal and then being disappointed that people don't go, oh my gosh, that's worth so much. Let me pay you some big dollars for it because it's so cool. Like, no, they're going to think it's so cool and they're going to want to get it for a buck. Like, that's how it works. Yeah. And so, yeah, like Denise said, <laughs> maybe it's fun. Maybe it isn't fun. Okay. Jasmine on Facebook said, I enjoy giving stuff to someone that I directly know who is in need. And I know that my stuff is passed on to good hands. Maybe that's part of my emotional blocks, too. Well, it's got to be, it's certainly more rewarding to give it directly to people that you know, and you know, it's benefiting them. And it's like, you get to see the final destination. And so you feel like it landed safely somewhere and it's going to be value because it's your friend, right? And you don't know what your friend is really, whether your friend's being a hundred percent honest with you, frankly, um, they may be saying, oh, thanks so much for giving me your clutter you don't really know right and so <laughs> it is um it is something that makes you feel better but it but it may not be as much of a um bonus as you think that it is and um, clearly you're going to attempt to find out from somebody do you need this can you use this does you help does it help you and if it does then you're going to feel better about it but i think it's important to try to develop the trust and the belief that wherever you, whatever charity you, you agree to serve and support will give you, well, they're going to make an attempt to get it to somebody that needs it too. Like that's part of it. And you kind of have to trust because the thing about giving want something to each of your, to somebody that, you know, those are small item solutions, not, big volume solutions, right? Like you can you can't give 75 things to one friend. You can give 75 things to Goodwill or to the church charity or the women's shelter or the pet shelter, but you can't get rid of a bunch, right? And so there may be special things that you want to give to your friends and it makes you feel better that that thing that's special to you goes to someone who is special to you and it has a soft landing that you can predict, but it's not going to be a bulk solution for all of your stuff, right? You don't have that many friends. <laughs> you don't have enough spaces for your things to go where you know the solution. And so the, I'm trying to think how to say this. The, the mitigating solution, the, the, the better solution for you is 
finding a charity that you really believe in, finding a charity that is going to serve a purpose that you value, that's going to serve a population that you feel connected to. You know, a lot of times I give things away to um, the SPCA, uh, I mean the park. It's the local shelter here that is a no-kill shelter. So I have a hookup and I give things to bark. And so those things go on and get used in a population where there's a bunch of pets and they're doing a lot of rescuing and everything that I can give them to use is something that helps them do their mission. And I am too soft-hearted to be a rescue person because I would become an animal hoarder if I even let myself think about it too hard. So this is a way that I can, I value that people are willing to be on the front lines of rescuing and supporting pets and rehoming them. And I do that by giving donations there. And that gives me the satisfaction that I'm trying to support a cause without taking every pet bed and finding a pet owner and giving it to somebody that I know. You see the difference? The women's shelter is someplace where I peel off women's clothes and toiletries and um, personal care products and take them straight to the women's shelter so that the women's shelter who has a population of people constantly in need I'm supplying people that need and I'm grateful that someone's doing that work and I think that's important work and so part of how I feel good about what's being given away is that I'm giving to support a cause that I think is doing good work in the world and I think finding a substitute for it went to my friend and therefore I trust and know that it went someplace good you need to find a substitute place for your stuff to land that makes you feel okay because you can't give everything you own to your friends <laughs> at some point they're not going to return your calls and that'll be the end of that pipeline <laughs> diana on facebook said control issues come into play too the idea that things must go to this place or that place makes it hard to just give away to any donation place and she found a refugee place and gives all the nice clothes and shoes, et cetera, there, which is a relief to her. And now other donations can just go to the general donation place, which has helped a lot. Yeah, I mean, you know, I certainly give away to a bunch of places I have. On my list is Park, the Women's Shelter, Medical Bridges, Texas Art Asylum, and Goodwill. So I have five piles going in my garage all the time for my clients and they're all going off to support different um, functions. And also because things that medical bridges can take medical appliances and medical um, equipment is not something that goodwill can do anything with. Right. So I'm also channeling things to places where they will actually get used. And so this is, uh, this is a process you can develop for yourself where you can say, I have some categories of stuff and these people can use this. And like you said, the nice clothes went to here and these, this stuff can go here and this stuff can go here. And then the rest can go in the general pile. And I think uh, finding a few favorite charities to take the various types of stuff you're giving away regularly will help you feel a little bit better about it. I hope I know it's not the same as giving everything to your friends but your friends don't want all your stuff. And so you got to find an alternative. <laughs> That's the bottom line. Can yeah. you tell me the URL for Texas Art Asylum off the top of your head? Oh yeah. TexasArtAsylum.com. Okay. They also have a Facebook Excellent. page. They also have um, an Instagram page. And so uh, you can look them up on there and see they tend to go onto Facebook and Instagram and put on, um, you know, when they have really cool things that come in the shop and they want to sell them separately they'll uh, put them on Facebook or if they have things that are just super cool and weird, they'll put something up there just cause it's cool to look at it. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's fun to follow their Facebook page and see what they put up there. Okay. We're out, we're running out of time. I'm going to come back to you for final thoughts, but first okay. a couple of quick announcements. We would like to say thank you to our newest Patreon supporters, Karen, Elizabeth, Kira Lynn, and Isabel. Kissing to all of y'all. Your support helps us to keep, these webcasts coming and will enable us to launch new projects that are in the works. If you'd like to help out, go to cfhou.com slash Patreon. That's the little Patreon logo. I've never seen that before. How it fun. is. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank okay. you. Okay. 
our next webcast will be on Tuesday, September 15th at noon U.S. Central Time, live in Zoom and streaming on Facebook. We're going to continue our series on a decluttering philosophy, changing our relationship to stuff. Next week, we're going to talk about habits and behaviors. We'll explore the actions that you do and the things that you buy out of habit. We'll talk about existing habits around putting stuff away and how to cultivate better habits for keeping stuff from becoming clutter. Okay, Gail, your final thoughts on this topic. Okay. We really want to encourage you to reflect on which emotions or drives are influencing your own tendencies to acquire too much, to keep too much, or to experience difficulty in letting go of things. Then think about what we discussed in last week's episode, your personal definition of a good life. With a fresh sense of awareness about what you want your life to be like and what things you'll need to support that life, think about what positive emotions you would feel in your beautiful and less cluttered space. We hope you'll find fresh energy and inspiration to keep working towards that life. If you're watching this on YouTube, we'd love for you to join us live. To get notifications, we invite you to join the meetup group by visiting cfhou.com slash meetup. You can also follow us on Facebook by going to cfhou.com slash Facebook or subscribe to our mailing list by visiting cfhou.com slash subscribe. One of our YouTube commenters mentioned not getting notifications. So if you subscribe on YouTube, be sure you click the little bell icon next to the subscribe button so that YouTube will notify you when we post something new. We love to hear from you. So please keep sending us your questions and topic suggestions in the YouTube comments on Facebook or anywhere else you can find us. And you can always reach us through our website at clutterfairhouston.com. Thanks everybody for coming today. I appreciate that you guys are um, making an effort to chat with us and sending emails our way. And I'm really uh, enjoying interacting with everybody about this topic. So please keep it up and we will see you next week. Bye. Bye-bye.